Hello, hello. Okay, guys, if you can. <laughs> can you hear me? Great. Um, you know, we do a lot of different events. Are, are we ready? Are we rolling? Are we rolling, Bob? That was a famous Highway 61, I think, or something. We're ready? Okay. Welcome to Books and Books. Welcome live at Books and Books. I'm Mitchell Kaplan. On behalf of everyone here at the store, I want to say this is going to be a very, very special evening. Um, you know, we do a lot of different events at this store, at some of the other stores. Um, and you can find out what's happening by going to the front counter and picking up a flyer, which will give you, you know, all the things that go on. If you're kind of more electronically oriented, you can sign up for our newsletter, and we will mail you... You will never feel lonely again if you're on the Books and Books email list uh, with all the different events that we have coming up. And we've got some marvelous things coming up. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, we have the author of Natchez Burning, Greg Isles, will be here along with Dave Barry, and they're going to be in conversation. We've got uh, Garrison Keeler coming in a couple of days. Uh, we have... Um, Secretary Geithner will be here. Uh, he'll be at Miami-Dade College. We're doing that in conjunction with the center at Miami-Dade College. So we have a lot of exciting things happening, including tonight. 
But tonight is an event that I've been pointing to for a long, long time. I want to just give you a little bit of a history of how sometimes these things work, uh, how booksellers sometimes, you know, find out about books. And, you know, there are probably over 150,000 books published each year. And certainly we can't carry all of them. Uh, so we have to select those books that really mean something to us or that we think we want to expose our customers to. So about a year or so ago, I happened to be in western Massachusetts, and an email came across uh, my, uh, my computer. And with that email came a PDF. And on that PDF was this remarkable book that I clicked open and started reading. And the next thing I knew, it was morning. And uh, I read this book called The Storied Life of A.J. Fickery. And it was by an author, Gabrielle Zevin, uh, whom I didn't really know that well. But I knew that she had written some... Oh, God, that's bad. <laughs> that is bad. Uh, everybody, please turn your cell phones off. Um, that was actually my daughter who calls me at this time at every event just to remind me to do that. Um, I, we knew Gabrielle's work from a number of children's books that she had written. Uh, she's also a, a very talented screenwriter as well. But what drew me into this book uh, more than anything else was its remarkable, um, remarkable sense and love of all things literary, uh, from bookstores to books to people who run bookstores to people who sell books to writers. It was it was it spoke to me so incredibly directly that the next uh, few hours later, or the next evening, I wrote a letter to the publisher, who is a friend that I know. And the next thing I know, this letter ended up on the galley, which is this, on the back of the galley right here. And so I just thought, as by way of introduction, I would read, I would read that letter, which was my very first connection to this book. And I really had no real idea uh, that it would take the country by storm, although I had a kind of an inkling. Uh, given how soulful this book was. Um, so anyway, I just thought I'd read this. Uh, and this was a, a letter written to other books, booksellers. You know, Dear friend, as a bookseller in Miami, I've often fantasized what it would be like to own a bookstore on a Martha's Vineyard-like island in the Northeast. I love the tropics, but the change of seasons, a more wild ocean, a less urban setting all appeal to me too. Reading the storied life of A.J. Fickery by Gabrielle Zevin is most likely the closest I'll ever come to experiencing what it might be like to sell books in that kind of a place. And that's the great surprise of this marvelously engaging novel. I've never read a narrative that so vividly paints a picture of what it's like to be a bookseller and the way in which Ms. Zevin makes A.J. Fickery's story a universal one is astounding. To humanity on display in the storied life of A.J. Fickery, mixed with its refined literary sensibility, kept me awake through the night, bringing smiles, tears, and a sense of awe at the life lived and the joy found by a bookseller who could be any one of us. By flipping through the first pages of this galley, you'll see that I'm not alone in my admiration. And what I meant by that is there's literally pages and pages of... Um, of, uh, of, of quotes by booksellers all across the country talking about their love for this book. Um, I'm not alone in my admiration. Many of my bookselling colleagues have also, also fallen under Gabrielle Zevin's spell. And we have a very special novel that we will all take great delight in sharing with readers for a very long time to come. And I hope that all of you will feel the same way I do. Those of you who haven't read it are in for a gigantic treat. And for those of you who have not heard Gabrielle speak, you're in for a treat, too. Please welcome Gabrielle Zemmer. Good. Um, let's see. Thank you very much for that and for that letter. I've been traveling with my ARC and letting signed copy stickers gradually encroach over this letter, so it's nice to hear it again. Um, this is the story life of A.J. Fickery. It's a book about a curmudgeonly bookseller, and there are other kinds um, other than the curmudgeonly kind, but a curmudgeonly bookseller who finds a baby in a bookstore. Um, it's about a manuscript that gets stolen, a very valuable priceless manuscript, and it's about various other things too, but before I 
talk more about the book. I'm going to talk about myself because that's uh, the inevitably narcissistic place we have to go to talk about a book. Um, and then I'll read a tiny bit from this book at various points, maybe three times. Then you'll ask questions after a respectfully awkward silence. <laughs> and it will all be splendid. Um, I sold my first novel in February of 2004 and my second novel in July of that same year. And I have to tell you that I have rarely felt as pleased with myself as I did in July of 2004. That's because there's no time so sweet in a young writer's career as a time between when you have your book deal and your first book actually has to come out into the world. I had ideas about what I thought publishing was going to look like and those ideas mainly came from movies I'd seen and books I'd read. So I'm thinking kind of like Wonder Boys or John Irving or Little Women and particularly in the movie version of Little Women when Joe is published. Her first book shows up wrapped in brown paper delivered to her by an older German man lover. And on some level I kind of thought perhaps that was how publishing would work. An older German man lover would show up with my book wrapped in brown paper, cut to New York Times bestseller list, cut to me walking down the streets of Manhattan and every window, every shop window, even like Bergdorf Goodman's would be filled with like the cover of my book and only my book and my picture would be on the side of a bus and it would all be very fantastic. I thought I was on the verge of a literary fame that included, you know, feuds with other authors, readings at the 92nd Street Y, you know, perhaps I'd end up with a, a drunk but only like a nice drunk, the kind of drunk where it would help my work along, you know. I wouldn't be an abusive drunk or messy drunk, nothing like that. And I've talked to many novelists over the years, and most of them have very sad first novel stories, not unlike mine. And I think that's because the gap between what your expectation of what publishing is going to look like and what it actually does look like is vast. Um, but if I go back in time, before I was published, everything to do with bookstores for me was basically a joy. Um, I can think of like the Grow Your Poetry Shop in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and that's a 700 square foot store in Cambridge devoted entirely to poetry. I was just in Cambridge, Massachusetts on this book tour, which has been about a thousand days. Actually, it's been about 45 days, but, <laughs> but it feels kind of like a thousand days. So I'm on day 996 right now. <laughs> But I can think of the Grow Your Poetry Shop in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and it still exists. And I don't know about you, but I like living in a world where a 700 square foot shop devoted entirely to poetry can still exist. And I think of Murder, Inc., which used to be a bookstore devoted entirely to crime on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And when you went to Murder, Inc., a big black, like Hound of the Baskerville style black dog would greet you when you came through the door. <laughs> And he would, at least me, I don't know, maybe everybody but me, he would really like ram in the butt really hard <laughs> with his big dog nose. And I like being sold books that way. <laughs> and then if I think about sort of the first time I was ever in a bookstore, and if you don't know, I grew up in South Florida, in Boca Raton. I'm a graduate of Spanish River High School. Um, Yes. Oh, see, that was an interesting sound. It kind of, that's actually the official sound of Spanish River High School. It's kind of a sad, dying manatee sound. At pep rallies, it just goes, mm. <laughs> But yes, I, so the first bookstore I ever went in was in Boca Raton, Florida. And it was in a grocery store, that, like a, it was not in a grocery store, but it was in a little shopping plaza that included a Publix. And I can call it Publix, which I can't call it anywhere else in the world. But it was in a Publix, and next to the Publix was a place called the Village Bakery. And next to the Village Bakery was a place called the Village Bookstore. And my parents, who were both in computers, would, let, would do their grocery shopping on the weekends, but they would let me roam free in the bookstore next to the bakery, next to the Publix. And my dad would give me five or ten dollars and he would, you know, just let me loose. And I can still, to this day, when I walk into a bookstore, I associate the experience with this sort of heady sense of freedom and possibility. And of course, this was the mid-80s. I think it's kind of crazy that my parents would let their tiny child, their only child, loose in a store. But I guess they were under the impression that nothing bad would ever happen to me in a bookstore. <laughs> and in fact, nothing bad ever has happened to me in a bookstore. So most of my books have started with the question, uh, but for the storied life of A.J. Fickrey, I had two. And the first was, why do bookstores matter? And the second was, how do the stories we read define our lives? 
It's been a little over 10 years since I sold my first novel, and these years have been a time of enormous change for the publishing industry. The rise of the e-reader, and uh, you know, I should tell you, when I did my first book contract a decade ago, e-rights sometimes were not addressed at all, and if they were addressed, the split was like 75% to the author, 25% to the publisher. That's because that's how little a decade ago publishers cared about e-books, and now, of course, they're sort of uh, part of our lives. Um, the way social media has kind of changed the author-reader relationship, the question of whether to order online or shop locally, which of course you all have answered by coming here today, and I assume coming here often. Um, and of course, I wanted to write a book that talked about all of those things. But for me, uh, the storied life of A.J. Fickrey is really about the difference books can make in a person's life. It's about A.J.'s daughter, Maya, and the way her life has changed for the better because it has books in it, and because her mother left her in a bookstore as opposed to any other place. So I'm going to read briefly um, a couple times tonight. And I promise it will be very briefly, because after 10 years of doing author readings, I'm aware of the fact that nobody likes to be read to for a half hour. <laughs> and I'm also aware, and this is a crazy thing, most people that come to readings are actually able to read. <laughs> so. Right, <laughs> right, and they rather like doing it themselves, you know? <laughs> Maya knows that her mother left her in island books, but maybe that's what happens to all children at a certain age. Some children are left in shoe stores, and some children are left in toy stores, and some children are left in sandwich shops, and your whole life is determined by what store you get left in. She does not want to live in the sandwich shop, and in a way, I have to tell you, I think this is true. So I've also written books for young people, which Minshul mentioned, and I've gotten to speak in schools quite a bit over the last decade, and here's what I can tell you. Children who read grow into adults that you want to know. And this isn't a nice thing to say, because I also am very sympathetic to the fact that children only read when the adults in their lives force books into the, like, literally into their faces, you know? I am a reader because my parents were readers because they took me to the library like it was church, because my grandparents, my grandfather the communist, I was just talking <laughs> to Mitchell about, because my grandfather brought me books every time he saw me. In fact, um, <laughs> I remember when I was 14, 13 or 14, him bringing me this book and him telling me it was going to be like the most amazing book ever. It was Salman Rushdie's Satanic Verses. <laughs> and I'll tell you, I actually liked that he thought that might be something I would like to read. So I appreciated that about the gift. Um, so yes, children who read grow into adults that you want to know. And it's not a joke. When you give a child a book, they start to understand that there are people and places in the world beside themselves who think thoughts and have experiences other than the ones they have themselves. And you and I maybe call this empathy. Child psychologists call this theory of mind. But it turns out that empathy is a really great quality in a future citizen or a future person you want to share your town with. It's interesting because everywhere I go, people want to tell me about their bookstores. And maybe it's because I'm an author, but I don't think so. I think it's because bookstores represent the good in a community. There are few places in public life that aren't just about survival, that are truly about the exchange of ideas. Books are more than commerce. I think that. There are a few things you can give to a person that have the ability to sort of change their mind and their heart and their way of thinking. And if we extend that then, bookstores, the places that sell these books, are also more than commerce. Um, I think about this pretty often. Writing is a very solitary activity. And reading is equally solitary. Unless you're reading a picture book to a child, most of us read alone. But the sort of amazing counterintuitive miracle about reading is that somehow bookstores, books, connect us to a community. And our booksellers do this too. So I'm going to read to you a tiny bit. Actually, I'll set up the clip. It says, set up the clip in my notes like it's a movie. Um, so this is a scene where Amelia, who is the sales rep, and a publisher sales rep is somebody who comes to a town and they sort of pitch all the books on their publisher's list to the bookseller. And I will tell you that when I got into publishing a decade ago, I had put a lot of time um, thinking about sort of the contents of a book, but very little time thinking about how a book got from a publisher in New York 
to a bookstore like this one. And it turns out that a sales rep is very important in this process, and particularly as an author, if you would like your book to actually end up in a bookstore. So I'm going to read a scene where Amelia comes, and A.J. Fickery, the titular A.J. Fickery, will tell her the things he doesn't want her to pitch him anymore. Amelia closes the nightly catalog. Mr. Fickery, please, just tell me what you like. Like, he repeats with distaste. How about I tell you what I don't like? I do not like postmodernism, post-apocalyptic settings, post-mortem narrators, or magic realism. I rarely respond to supposedly clever formal devices, multiple fonts, pictures where they shouldn't be, basically gimmicks of any kind. I find literary fiction about the Holocaust or any other major world tragedy to be distasteful. Nonfiction only, please. I do not like genre mashups a la the literary detective novel or the literary fantasy. Literary should be literary and genre should be genre and crossbreeding rarely results in anything satisfying. I do not like children's books, especially ones with orphans, and I prefer not to clutter my shelves with young adults. I do not like anything over 400 pages or under 150 pages. I am repulsed by ghost-written novels by reality television stars, celebrity picture books, sports memoirs, movie tie-in editions, novelty items, and I imagine this goes without saying, vampires. <laughs> I rarely stock debuts, chiclet, poetry, or translations. I would prefer not to stock series, but the demands of my pocketbook require me to. For your part, you needn't tell me about the next big series until it is ensconced on the New York Times bestsellers list. Above all, Ms. Lohman, I find slim literary memoirs about little old men whose little old wives have died from cancer to be absolutely intolerable. No matter how well written the sales rap claims they are, no matter how many copies you promise I'll sell on Mother's Day. <laughs> and that was the first thing I wrote of this book, actually. <laughs> It was a very cleansing moment for me. Um, and I can tell you this, thank you. <laughs> and I can tell you the secret of that is I've written quite a few of the things on that list. Um, but yes, I will tell you, I've known a lot of people in publishing and I've known a lot of booksellers over the years. And something I can tell you about their character is that no one gets into bookselling for money. There are easier ways to make money than messing around with the business of giving people stories. Combine this with the fact that the way they make money is because of their very particular tastes. Um, and that's what you get, these very particular individuals. And I have to say, having thought about this for a long time, I actually believe, though AJ, of course, is at his most ridiculous, this is page 12 of the book, um, though he's at his most ridiculous then, he's actually right to have his taste. A couple of years ago, I was on book tour, and I was in a big store in Colorado. And I was looking around, and I had something that might be called an epiphany. It occurred to me that there are far more authors than booksellers. Now, when you sell a book, you kind of think, look at this, they've put my name on the jacket. I am a world builder, you know? I'm very important. But in fact, Mitchell said something like 150,000 books will be published this year. I've heard as much as 350,000 books will be published in a given year. And then add that to the fact that another 350,000 books will be self-published in a given year. In any case, when you publish and you become an author, you have this notion that we, I, am a very special snowflake. <laughs> but in fact, the, the future of literary culture depends a bit on people telling us what is good and what is not good. Booksellers are our curators, and these places are the closest we have to literary museums. Um, I was driving Chicago recently on this book tour, which started, as you know, a thousand days ago, um, which actually started on March 27th. But I told my publisher that I didn't want to drive any major cities, but they decided that, I guess, that the Midwest, like Chicago, didn't count as a major city. <laughs> So I was driving the Midwest from Milwaukee to Chicago. And that was the week where like, the weather went crazy. It turned like pitch black in the middle of the day. And I was really patting myself on the back for the decision I made to upgrade my car from the Ford Focus to the Volvo station wagon. <laughs> but in any case, I was driving, and it turned pitch black. And uh, the rain was pouring down. And I, it occurred to me that everyone thinks they are a really good driver but I am reasonably sure that I am, at best, a mediocre to OK driver. And similarly, everybody thinks, and certainly online retailers empower us in this notion, 
that they are really, really great at picking books. But how do we choose among 350,000 books? And that's where sort of booksellers come in. I read an anecdote not that long ago that was from a book that was about the history of the beginning of publishing and printing. It was called, uh, I believe it's called, I, I should really write it down, I believe it's called The History of the Book by Adrian Johns. And in it he talks about that when printing was first founded, um, people in England basically freaked out because when you printed something, that made it true. So who then should be allowed to print, to publish? You know, you, these were the truth dealers. And uh, they kind of thought about it, and they went back and forth. And one of the ideas that had been proposed and ultimately rejected was that printers, publishers, booksellers should be licensed in the same way that doctors are. And I think this is a very interesting notion. Um, when I think about books, I don't know, and as I, sa I said this to you already, really, I don't know that many other objects that have sort of a prescriptive nature and a prescript prescriptive benefit. Um, so not so long ago, I wrote a book about the future. And it was one of my children, and it was one of my young adult novels. And in my future, there were no libraries and no paper books, right? Um, and the thing about that is, of course, it was a very popular series. It wasn't a very popular series at all. But I find that I don't worry so much about like the kids fighting kids, and I don't worry about Chicago getting divided up into factions based on personality types. I do, however, worry very much about what the world without books looks like. And as I've said a couple times tonight, the 10 years since I sold my first novel have been a time of enormous change for publishing. Publishing a book in 2005 was, in fact, not so terribly dissimilar from publishing one in 1950. Bear with me a second. Um, when I published my book, in 2005, there was a book party that involved wine and cheese. Um, I bought a dress at Filene's basement, which no longer exists. <laughs> and that was pub day, you know. There was no Twitter. There was no Facebook yet. There was no YouTube. There was, ebooks didn't factor very much. Um, no Kindle yet. Um, I think my first book, which was very popular, which was pretty popular, we won't give it very, we'll call it pretty popular. My first book, which was pretty popular, I sold in that first year probably like three copies in E or something, you know? It was, you know, nobody bought that way. And I don't tell you all this because I think that we should fight technology, but more that it's worth being mindful of what these changes mean. Um, you know, one thing I could point out to you is that and I think about this because now there's a little you know, tussle going on in publishing with the Hachette company and a major online retailer. And this tussle you know, is over many things. But so anyway, if I think about when you go and buy an ebook at major online retailer, it's interesting to me that, in fact, you're not buying a book at all. I don't know if people know this. All you're actually buying is a license, and they have the right to take away that book to you at any, take away that book from you at any point in time. I think this is interesting, you know? So I'll let you, that can simmer. You can bring it to your next dinner party if you want. <laughs> Let's let that idea marinate a bit. Um, so I only have one more thing to tell you, and people laugh at me when I say this, but I am almost fortunate, I feel almost fortunate that I didn't have sort of JK Rowling level success. I had enough success that I've been able to do nothing but write books for the last decade, so that's great. But I didn't have so much success that I wasn't able to sort of figure out um, how the ecosystem of publishing actually worked and why it mattered. And it turns out, and I won't elaborate with this because I don't want to lecture you endlessly, but it turns out that the kind of books I want to read and the kind of books I want to write, the fate of that kind of fiction is linked to the fate of brick and mortar bookstores for a variety of reasons. So the original title of this book was The Collected Works of A.J. Fickrey. And each of the chapters of this book kind of take their name after a short story. Um, because having been an author who's written a few flops <laughs> and a few hits, I have always loved buying collected works. And if you think about it, when you buy a collected work, what happens is for one low bargain price, you get the hits and you get the misses. And in fact, the buying of the hits 
sort of redeems these misses, you know? So as an author, as I said, who's had a mixed career, I um, liked the idea of collected works. And the more I thought about it, the more I liked the idea for people as well. So I'm going to read you a tiny bit from the end of this book. And don't worry, as you can see, I've crossed out all the parts that are spoilers for those who haven't read it yet. But it won't help you with the test I'm going to give. <laughs> We read to know we're not alone. We read because we are alone. We read and we are not alone. We are not alone. My life is in these books, he wants to tell her. Read these and know my heart. We are not quite novels. The analogy he is looking for is almost there. We are not quite short stories. In the end, we are collected works. He has read enough to know there are no collections where each story is perfect. Some hits, some misses, if you're lucky, a standout. And in the end, people only really remember the standouts anyway, and they don't remember those for very long. And that's the end of my talk. Let awkward. <laughs> Thank you. I'll applaud myself. <laughs> I think it's just because I remind him of his daughter. <laughs> yes? Miami-Dade County, we're having a big fight. We have been for the past few years about the libraries and the funding. Right. And uh, did you hear about it, or is it just a nationwide thing? Um, well, I think that fight's going on many places, but I don't know the specifics of the, the fight that's happening here. And I'm glad the questions are starting out on a really good, like, combative note. <laughs> you know? So good. Right. <laughs> After they built all these branches or rented all these branches all over town. And um, it, it's like a, a really big problem because there's a lot of people that don't have computers. They have to go to the library to use them. And, and then there's other people that just like to have books and they can't afford to buy them. Right. And, and by the way, I'm a good customer here, right, Mitch? <laughs> 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 um, but I was just wondering what your take is on the, the whole situation because e-books and Kindles can't. Right. I mean, I have a couple thoughts on that. And I'm, again, not um, an urban planner or sort of an economist or anything like that. But, you know, in California, where I live, a similar fight went on. And there was a library in California that wanted to open up a bookless library. So that was just going to be computers because their, their feeling was that that's how um, that would be the best service to their community. And I'm certainly, I understand that and I'm sympathetic to that. However, um, when the government, you know, provided for the creation of libraries, they weren't providing for the creation of like computer centers to serve the public, you know. So I think if that's what we're saying a library has become, we have to rethink how like tax dollars are allocated to that, you know, because in a way, um, the library is meant to house uh, to house books. Um, and as I said to you before, even thinking about ebooks. We're not buying permanent collections when we buy ebooks. We're buying licenses for books, you know. So, in other words, if you know they're going to change the way a library is used, we have to rethink, sort of, you know, policy. You know, we have to think about if we still want to pay for a library to be used that way, or if we need to then allocate different taxes differently for sort of, you know, um, which is all a very dangerous thing. I'm, I, my main thing I always want to say, and I already said in my talk, is that. We do have to just be very mindful and continue to ask questions about what technology changes mean for what we have, you know, um, and that's all we can do, you know. But I'm obviously I want libraries to, sur to survive. I want them to serve the community in the best way they can. But I'm not sure that a computer lab is a library anymore, <laughs> you know. And I said both my parents worked at IBM. My mother, um, as in the book, bought me my first Nook for Christmas a couple years ago. Um, I find that I like the Nook because, first of all, the Nook was, I shouldn't say this. Anyway, the Nook was, uh, it was really good because it fit onto like a treadmill, like reader very well, better than, if you want to read something like the Goldfinch, you know, yeah. and Eve probably makes sense for that. But however, I do find on a personal note that when I read something in E, I tend to remember it a lot less well, you know. 
So I, I do wonder about these things, you know, and in terms of even like as we convert sort of schools to reading more primarily in E, you know, and things like that, you know, we want to our time to be valuable. Um, we want our time to be made the best use of. We don't want to all just be reading things really quickly that we then forget, you know. Um, so I think it's worth, again, thinking about what everything means. But yes, but just to say I'm not sure that a bookless library is a library, you know. But I want them all to survive. <laughs> yes? It was a dark and stormy night in Volvo. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> it was a dark and stormy middle of the day. So it was like noon, and it went dark. And all that happened is that I made it from one Marriott courtyard to the next Marriott <laughs> courtyard, you know, in the long line of Marriott courtyards. Um, I made it. I did make it, although I could never get the backup cam to work. Um, <laughs> Which doesn't matter so much in the rain, but you know. <laughs> yes? Uh, you? <laughs> yes? Yeah, I was just going to say that I, I loved your book. Oh, that thank you. But more importantly, I think Andrew Carnegie would be turning over in his grave yeah, at the idea that he's endowed so many libraries yeah. publicly all over yes. the country right. and people are reading Kindles. Now, right. Um, a book is like a fine wine, it's to right. be savored, come back to, read it, keep you company. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something special for you. I think your book was wonderful. What I'm amazed at is that you were raised a book over time. It sounded like you were raised in the Northeast. Well, my parents are from Connecticut, okay. um, and I was born in New York, as many, as many, you know, who end up in Boca Raton, Florida. <laughs> um, right. And I've lived my life now at this point more in New York than anywhere else, and I recently moved to California. And I'm a citizen of the country. I'm not really from anywhere. But... Um, but something you said uh, was interesting to me. I wanted to say something about it. Something about Carnegie, but now it's, it's kind of flitted out. It's flitted out of my head. Yeah, it's turning over in his grave. Yeah, I mean, but, but there was even something else. I can't remember what it is. <laughs> Apologies. Memories of Boca Raton, Florida <laughs> fill my brain. And <laughs> Yes? Since you are a lover of bookstores, and I wonder if you've ever thought about what happens to cities that don't have bookstores, and I mean like Mitchell's, with knowledgeable people and who yeah. make these curatorial selections. What happens to a community where you just don't have this? You know, nothing good happens to that community. <laughs> and it, I have to say it's a sad thing. Um, you know, for instance, there was a store I heard of in the Pacific Northwest, and I think they're called Queen Anne, but I've been to about like over 100 stores in the last month, so don't quote me on that. But I feel like uh, what I heard about their store was that it closed, um, and the community really freaked out when that happened. And then it opened three months later. They found a way to make it reopen. And now that community really, really appreciates that store. You know, they had the threat of the loss of it, and that's really changed their relationship relationship to it and it's kind of a small success and you know I think about that people will often ask me when I'm on tour Gabrielle how do we keep our bookstores and I'll say to them it's actually very simple you just have to go and shop in them you know it isn't terribly complicated um, you know but in terms of the places where there aren't bookstores anymore and there are increasingly a num those places um, in a way like they also benefit from the work that bookstores here do because oftentimes, say, major online retailers follow the curation that happens at the store level, you know? Um, and so there is still some benefit, even if you don't have a store right where you are, th that you benefit from. Yes? The other thing I want to say is that it, it, for me, it's a big question. If you don't have libraries with actual books on the shelves to browse, and you don't have bookstores like this, you really don't have very much. Um, way to find books except if you read like the New York Times mm -hmm. book review thing or whatever. In other words, it puts the curating or the control in a very few hands right. to tell you what's out there. Right. And this is problematic. You know, who decides what's good, um, that kind of thing. But I feel, um, you know, and that is why the local movement really matters because, and people will ask me this. Like, what's the difference between Barnes & Noble and, say, a store like this one? Yeah. And there's a lot of difference. And obviously, from my point of view, and I think from most authors' point of, points of view and people in publishing, we want Barnes & Noble to survive. However, the real difference is one about where the curation happens. So Barnes & Noble is curated at the national level, usually in New York, based on um, 
people there and it's curated for every store. So when you go into a Barnes and Noble and say, you know, Colorado or something, it's going to be the same merchandise that you see at Barnes and Noble in New York City. There isn't a sense of that kind of thing. But a local store actually curates on based on what it believes the taste of their readers to be locally. And so you actually have a better chance of stumbling upon a book you love if you go into a store that is near you. You know, but you know, there's not an easy solution. I feel like um, in the last couple of years, we've seen a rise in the number of people opening bookstores. I know that this statistic is true. Um, and I feel like um, I feel like the bookstore is back. I feel optimistic about the bookstore. Um, I do. Uh, applause is welcome, you know. <laughs> but I did remember what I wanted to say to you. And that was, you know, people have the notion that buying an e-reader is cheap, you know. That really, because, you know, for most people, like $99 or what have you. And this goes to something you were saying, too. But in fact, for a lot of people, if, say, libraries convert only to e-books, that will eliminate many readers, because there aren't enough devices to give one to everyone in a community. So it basically makes it so that the wealthy can read and the poor, good luck to you, if there aren't sort of you know, devices on which they can read them on. And I think this is something worth considering also in terms of the same discussion of like, you know, who gets to choose the economy, but also even worse than that, who gets to read, yeah. you know? If you live in our house, the Wi-Fi doesn't always work. <laughs> <laughs> right. The poor, deprived people with a, an erratic Wi-Fi, you know, I feel your pain, you know? <laughs> How do you live? <laughs> well, we have a lot of books. Right. <laughs> right? Yes? Um, I grew up in a town where the uh, only place to get books was at Walmart. Right. But Yeah. So she was saying that, you know, a book that really made her love to read was The Mixed Up Files of Ms. Basil E. Frankweiler. And, you know, I feel like for a lot of people, there is that one book that turns them, like, from non reader to reader, you know? And most people, I'm kind of an optimist about this because it, statistically, people that don't read when they're young, they have a really hard time becoming readers when they're old. However, the optimist says to me, it's possible that they just haven't, like, found the right book yet. You know, in terms of the titles I selected throughout the book, like from the mixed up files of Miss Basil E. Frankweiler, long title, every time I say it, I'm like, <laughs> it's taking me a while to say it each time. Um, you know, in a way, the reading lists in this book are gloriously random and, di and dictated by my own gloriously random reading life. You know, so that was a book I loved. I remember, um, because I think it captures a child's imagination in, a very specific and amazing way. I remember taking a, a meeting. I also write screenplays, and you know we talked about that. And at this this screen that you know it was a meeting at Sony, I think, and they were like, you know, we can't make a movie of that because, you know, children, um, you know, with after 9/11, she said to me, you could never have a child like going into a museum. Security would be far too tight, you know. Um, so they really thought there was no movie prospect for this. And, and I kind of had that scene a little bit with the cop and his sort of responses to the idea of Miss Basil E. Frankweiler in a post-9-11 uh, you know, universe. Um, but yeah, so, and when I wrote the book, I thought it would be really interesting to describe characters based on what they read and how they read as opposed to their physical characteristics. So every character had a long reading list that went with them, you know, that I had before I started. And Maya's reading list was mainly consisted of things I loved when I was her age, you know. <laughs> yes? The tattered cover? The tattered sleeve is like, is like your favorite tailorer, you know, a tailor, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yes, I was at the Tattered, the tattered Cup. That's the place to go in. Yeah, nice big store. Yes? Um, I was really struck by the character of the, the cop. Right. And, um, I, and I, in my experience, I haven't 
really run across too many adults that have been led into a life of books in the way that he was. And right. I was wondering if you based him on a person that you've known or have you experienced that? I mean, there are things about him that are based on people I know. Like my best friend is a lawyer and she always talks about how she can't watch like The Good Wife because she has all these criticisms about the law. So early on in the story, I had the idea that, you know, you'd have a cop responding to a story with cops in it, you know, and how that sort of changes your perspective on whatever you're, you're reading at that time. Um, but yes, Lombiasi uh, is probably, I thought, the most fantastical element of it. Because as I said before, people don't tend to take up reading late in life. Although every time I do an, an event like this, somebody says, no, but me, I took up reading late in life, or that kind of thing. But um, with Lombiasi, I thought, but I will say, I went to a store actually in the Pacific Northwest where they told me they had a Lombiasi. They had a cop that came in every single day and bought what he read, you know? But I, you know, but he wasn't particularly based on anybody except sort of this notion that it would be interesting to have somebody who was in law enforcement responding to stories about law enforcement. And then as his, um, and I thought what was an equally interesting notion was that the more he read, the more he began to see the world in shades of gray, and he became actually ill-suited for his job as a police officer. He became a better reader and a worse cop, you know? <laughs> because he starts having empathy for like everyone. People do what they do, you know, that's not a good mindset for a, a police officer particularly. Um, so it is about his journey since you've read the book from sort of the profession he starts with to the profession he ends with, you know. And I also love the way that, that his, his changes in books, I mean his case changed as he got more sophisticated. Right. Every time well, he has a, he has a good book, a book, good bookseller who's able to like direct him into the right yeah. Yeah, that leads him through sort of, you know, his journey from Jeffrey Deaver, who I like I did talk to cops I knew that and they like Jeffrey Deaver. He gets the procedural stuff right, you know. So his journey from like sort of a mass market paperback to sort of, you know, finally he ends at like Cormac McCarthy, which stops at like Elmore Leonard and things along the way, you know. So I did think of that as his, you know, he had a really good bookseller, and that's what a good bookseller can do. They can kind of, they call it, when, when you're talking about children, they have a term for this, which is called the reading bridge, you know? So you give a kid, say, Twilight, and how do you get them to go from Twilight to Anna Karenina? And there's a series of steps that make perfect sense, you know? There's a series of books you can have that kind of promote them through reading lives, and so that's kind of what AJ does for that's probably AJ's best, ex his best example of book selling, because he's often a kind of mediocre bookseller. He's no Mitchell Kaplan, you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? <laughs> Through it, but yes, so. <laughs> I story of John Edward Mitchell. I've known Mitchell for many years, and you say curated uh, uh, bookstore. One day I walk in, and, and Mitchell sees me, and says, Eric, you're going to like this book. He says, it was <laughs> Alan first, and he was yes. so right. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, correspondence with Alan first, but that was right on. You're absolutely right. It's right. Accurate. I mean, a good bookseller is like a good primary care practitioner. You know, like they're going to know you, know what you like, know what to give you. You know, know what will like stretch you a little bit. You know, know what's solidly a vacation read for you. And you know, so I think of this sometimes. <laughs> well, and we're, we're blessed to have so many good booksellers here. I know that Darby had a question. One of our great booksellers. Yeah. No, I, I was just going to say that one of my favorite characters was the police officer, and I loved your metaphor of the bookstores being like a church. Right. Um, yes, I had a lady in a reading I did a couple nights ago who really didn't understand. Um, I'll just set this back over here. Um, <laughs> who really didn't understand that? She asked me to explain it, and I. Because it was a more, it was a more sort of uh, God-fearing part of the country, shall we say. So she really didn't understand the notion that a bookstore could be like a church, you know, for those of us that sort of, you know, worship at the, the written word, you know. So I, um, a community, right, that when they work really well, they're almost church-like, you know. They, they bring people to talk to you, like myself, in the way that a church does. They improve your life and they provide a sort of organization, like a thing to congregate around, you know, and not unlike a church. Um, but, you know, I was raised by a Jewish father and a mother who was uh, lapsed Catholic but had been raised Catholic in Korea. 
and th they didn't raise me with really any religion to speak of, to speak of, except that on Saturday we would go to Burger King, <laughs> <laughs> and after Burger King we would go to the, the public library, and that was church for me, like that. And I remember it was the first place I ever went that had um, that I got in like a card that had my name on it. And I remember that little card made me feel like, you know, a citizen of the world, you know? Like I am a person now, for I have a card with my name on it. You know, so I do think of myself as somebody who was, um, who was raised in books. And I think we're all raised in books, even for the people that are, say, raised in a, a more sort of traditional church. You know, they are raised by a certain kind of book, too. You know, different book than the ones I was raised by, which are many. Um, it was a Saturday, so it was probably temple that you were in the <laughs> church. Good point. <laughs> or a certain fundamentalist Christian sect, you know, like your, your Seventh-day Adventists, they go on Saturday, you know. But yes, it probably was. Good point. <laughs> yes? Right. So you were a person for whom books fall under like survival, yeah. you know? And, and right? she still is, because that's Lisette Mendez, who is with the Florida Center for Literary Arts and the Miami Book Fair as well. And yeah. she does a marvelous <laughs> job. <for her>. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the bookstores are in weather that is uh, really bad. In other words, you tend to read more when it's dark and miserable outside and you can't go outside. You like know, here. I don't know. Uh, but I do find that, in fact, that uh, book events tend to be very well attended uh, in places. Like, people do seem to read more when it's cold, you know? Like, you'll do bad book events in, like, Santa Barbara, you know? <laughs> Miami's kind of an exception to that. I don't know. I can't account for it. Maybe it's humid enough that the air conditioning is enough of a draw, <laughs> you know? But if the weather is too nice, too dry, too temperate, like a Santa Barbara, no one tends to want to go to a book event in Santa Barbara. But, um, but in Miami, you know, it's, it's different. So, but anyway. <laughs> we have a question over here. Yes. Oh, I just have a question. So, you talk a lot about your childhood and how you were a reader, and mm -hmm. children who read grow up to the adults who read, and I think everyone in this room obviously is a reader. But how do you make the jump from reader to writer? How do you make a jump from reader to writer? Um, well, ma'am, um, we went to school together, actually, at Spanish River High School in Boca Raton, Florida. Um, you know, I just don't know, but I, all I do know for sure is that uh, it's hard to become a writer if you don't read, you know? And I do occasionally meet kids that really would love to be writers and, you know, aren't so interested in reading books. And I think this is very difficult. That's a much more, but I don't actually know. You know, for me, um, I remember the first writing job I ever had came about as the result of an angry letter I wrote to the Fort Lauderdale Sun Sentinel. <laughs> and that was because I had this boyfriend, which maybe you remember him, Carrie Barsher. Um, I had this boyfriend, do you remember Lyle? Do you remember? I had this boyfriend, Lyle, who hopefully isn't here tonight. Lyle, no? <laughs> So I had this boyfriend, Lyle, and, you know, he was okay, but his main attraction at, when I was 14 was that he had a car, um, and with a car, and I didn't have a car. So we had plans to go see Guns N' Roses on New Year's Eve of that year, and, but by sort of the end of November of that year, I knew for sure that I didn't want to be in a relationship with Lyle anymore, but then how to solve the dilemma of how to get to the concert on the 31st, <laughs> right. So basically, the way I saw the dilemma was by pretending. Um, and that isn't how you become a writer necessarily, but I pretended for a month. And then at the end of that month, we went to the concert. And I remember coming home and the next morning breaking up with Lyle because his, his purpose in my life was finished. Um, and then the next morning, my dad showed me a, a review written by the music critic for the Fort Lauderdale Sun Sentinel. And it said that Axl Rose was terrible, that Slash had no stage presence. You know, it, had, it was very, very tough on poor Guns N' Roses. 
So I wrote like a two-page angry letter to the Fort Lauderdale Sun Sentinel. And a couple days later, I remember the, the editor there called me and he said, you know, you know, would you like a job writing music <laughs> reviews? At which point I decided I would probably need to reveal that I was 14. <laughs> and then he said, how would you like a job writing teen music reviews for the Fort Lauderdale Sun Sentinel? So that was my first writing job, um, $25 an article, which was a lot of money in 19... 92, $24 an article, and $25 an article and free concert tickets and free CD tickets. And um, so it was quite a good gig that I did for a couple of years. And, you know, so I always say, like, the reason, the first impulse to write maybe comes from the desire to express something, you know, like anger at the Fort Lauderdale Sun Sentinel <laughs> for not understanding what I had sacrificed to go to that concert, you know? Um, and I think that today, like I did, I did a teen book festival just in the middle. You do weird things. You do very weird things to promote a book. But I did a teen book festival in Ohio a couple days ago at Kent State. Um, and, you know, I had the kids write letters because on some level, every book, even this book, is a letter to somebody, you know. It's always dear somebody. And what you say to some people is something else. And so I do think, for me, the first thing I wrote a lot of, even before that letter to the Sun Sentinel, was I used to write letters to everybody. I'd write letters to like boys at, that I'd met at like, you know, summer camp that, uh, you know. And, and, and in a way, you know, sometimes having feelings that really had no bearing on anything that had actually happened between <laughs> us. So, that, you know, so I, all I know is, um, you know, that's how I started writing, was just, wanting to express things to people, you know. But I don't know how other people do it. Um, I don't. <laughs> I don't. I don't, ever, I don't ever have good advice for them, um, really, to tell you the truth. As to why, I don't know. <laughs> yes? But all of my friends who write say the most important thing is have the publisher, the agent. Right. Should be Lynn Nesbitt or somebody like that to get you the publicity to then be picked up. Right. Is this correct or no? I mean, I believe that to be so. I got my first literary agent who is no longer my literary agent. But the way I got him was I had already had a manager for screenwriting. Um, and at one point I decided I had this idea that wouldn't turn itself into a screenplay, that kind of turned itself into a book. And I said, I don't know what to do with this. And he said, well, good news. Um, I know a literary agent that I went to Jewish summer camp with. So I always say I got my first uh, literary agent through the powerful connection of Jewish summer camp, you know? Um, but then, so I went to, he was a William Morris agent, and I remember going to William Morris. I lived in New York City at the time. And we met in this huge conference room, and I thought, well, he must think I'm very important because we're meeting in this big conference room. But the reason we were meeting in the conference room was because he was just a guy on a desk. You know, he didn't actually have an office. He was like the he was the assistant to uh, he was the assistant to a guy named Owen Laster who is now deceased but who used to be like Judy Bloom's agent and a couple others. But anyway, this guy sold my book really really fast and maybe not particularly well but very fast and I was very grateful to him. Um, and yes, I do think so. Um, it's like needles in a haystack to be a, a writer who's just sort of sending manuscripts and hoping it's going to like hit upon some editor. There's like a many different editors at any publishing house and they're not all going to be the right ones for your book and it's impossible like you you know it takes a lot of sort of you know experience to know where to send things even more than sort of like the publicity or what have you it's it's finding the right home you know um so so yeah i found it to be key to my career having an agent Um, well, you know, you write a lot more screenplays than ever get made. So the first thing I ever sold was a vampire love story. And this was, <laughs> this was in like 2000. And, it, you know, I made money off this for years. They would give you, me a little option fee and then, you know, it wouldn't get made. But then somebody would want to keep the rights so they'd pay me again for it. And ultimately it would never get made because people thought there was no money in a straight vampire love story. <laughs> um, they turned out to be wrong. But, you know, <laughs> mine was very different. I'm not, it wasn't set in a high school, you know. It was set in, in a museum, and it was much more sort of a, a literary vampire love story. But, but yes, nobody knows what works until something works, you know, <laughs> is the thing about it. Well, I want to thank you for being Aww. here tonight. It thank you.
We're glad she's from Boca. Right? <laughs> we can call her one of one of our own. In any way, in any case, let's give Gabrielle another big round. Thank, Thank you. And I want to thank all of you for coming, and I want to thank all of you for having dinner here before, and I want to thank you for coming tomorrow night, too, and I want to thank you for buying five copies each of her book, and she'll be signing them right up here for you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.